wonderful that we're here in our black tie attire at this beautiful event. But what else can parents, can companies, can teachers do to encourage our youth to go into the field of science and mathematics? I think the number one thing is to make it fun. I mean, when it comes down to it, uh, the reason I do what I do today, uh, uh, even though you know I enjoy you know being successful in this area or that, uh, but that's you know largely luck also. Really, the secret is that I enjoy what I do and it's fun, and that's how I was taught, starting from elementary school, that math and science were fun. And employees are discouraged from working extreme hours. Once people push past about 60 hours a week, they're actually doing less work than they would have done at 40 hours a week. So if you ask all your employees to work 80 hours a week, you're paying them extra and you're getting less out of them. NPM's employees are even encouraged to go home if they're having a bad day. We can get more work done because we can, you know, we know if something is going on with somebody because they'll tell us. Uh, so we can work around them because, you know, we are human. When asked whether investors might be turned off by fewer hours, Schluter says there's no hourly equation that leads to success. He says it's more important to have a balanced mindset to make good decisions in order to meet the customer's needs. I wanted to take two years off to work full time at an organization called UnCollege. At UnCollege, we run a gap year program that helps young people become self-directed learners. We help universities navigate the changing attitudes towards higher education. We challenge the notion that taking a traditional path is the only one to success. So how does someone like me, someone who got straight A's in high school and was supposedly thrived in an academic environment, suddenly start working for UnCollege? It seems a bit strange. I guess it all started when I realized that I wasn't as awesome as everyone kept telling me I was. In the 11th grade, I took a social justice class. Um, we read an essay called The Disadvantages of an Elite Education. In it, William Derechowitz explains the consequences of the American education system, which implicitly prizes obedience and discipline above all else. Instead of cultivating the next generation of young leaders that America so desperately needs, what this has done instead is created a population of young people who are really good at following directions and who are really bad at thinking for themselves. After reading this essay, I was forced to take a good hard look at myself. Um, I was so used to being praised by teachers, parents, friends for my inherent leadership ability. Was it possible that I was just good at conforming to a norm? Was it possible that I had been herded into this narrow path, that I was really just an excellent sheep? Um, I was really ashamed to admit it, but yeah, I totally was. Um, I was the ultimate conformist. I spent my time figuring out how to make the grade and living up to the expectations that society set for me. And I did really well at it, but I was never really happy. So from there, I decided that I wanted to change. I didn't want to be this person anymore. Um, so I made it a point to think more critically and to make more intentional decisions about what, how, and why I wanted to learn. I think the most intentional decision that I've made so far has been to take time off before university. To me, this seemed like the perfect compromise. I could spend time pursuing self-directed learning, and if everything failed and I fell on my ass, I could still go back to university at the end of those two years as if nothing had happened. So in my mind, it seems like a, a rational and a very risk-free decision, but when I tell my parents, they didn't think so at first. In fact, they were very worried and very reluctant to let me delay university. It was difficult for them to understand why their daughter, who had supposedly done so well in school, didn't want to be there anymore. What will you do? They asked me. Won't you be a year behind all of your friends? Don't you want to learn? Um, let me say my parents are awesome. Um, they were very concerned for me, but I, I had good arguments to back myself up. I explained to them that I wanted to take time off from school, not from learning. I would do plenty of that on my own, whether that meant pursuing personal projects, finding interesting internships, or traveling the world. 
the possibilities were endless. So why is it that students are so scared? Um, American students, after a year in college, after a year spending time in the real world, will inevitably become more mature and more interesting and more capable of making their own decisions. Universities understand this, right? It's why folk high schools exist. It's why top schools like Harvard University have, for 40 years, included in their letter of admission the option to defer. It's why the Massachusetts Institute of Technology allows students to defer for almost any reason. It's why Stanford University adds a deferral as an option in the drop-down menu when you matriculate to university. They know that the ability to make intentional decisions and to design your own education is incredibly important. It's called being self-directed, and it's the number one skill that the market wants. Employers seek people who can take initiative, who can manage priorities, and who can succeed in a work environment. Universities don't encourage being self-directed. Um, in fact, they discourage it. They give you everything you need to know, and that backfires when you go and you try to find a job. That's probably why, in America, 44% of university graduates under the age of 25 are unemployed or have to take jobs that don't require a degree. If you add that to the fact that, on average, graduates leave with $27,000 in debt, uh, the situation is very dire. I know that here in Norway, higher education is free, so that number might seem irrelevant, but it's not at all. What this high figure of tuition reminds us is that the time we spend in university is never free. That regardless of whether or not we spend physical money to attend school, we are still paying for it with our time. Four years is at our age a significant chunk of it. Um, if we choose to go to university then, we have to do it deliberately. We have to go to school knowing why we're there and what we want to get out of it. We have to approach it as part of a larger educational journey. We have to be deliberate about the way we use our time in university for our future success. And colleges are really good at one thing. They're really good at preparing students for more time spent in school. What they're not really good at is preparing students for real life, and that's, that's what matters. At Uncollege, this is why we started the Gap Year program. We wanted to prepare students for real life, not just for school. Um, we actually welcomed our first cohort of fellows two weeks ago, 10 people who will spend the next year learning how to be successful personally and professionally, two things that are never covered in the classroom. I don't know why, because being personally and professionally successful is the only thing that matters when you leave the classroom. I'm really excited to see how these fellows develop and grow within the next year. But let's think ahead a little bit. What happens after a year to, someone, to a student who has left the school system? Um, I guess the best case scenario would be that they become significantly more self-directed. They increase the depth and the breadth of their experiences, and they gain a better perspective of the world around them. Now let's talk about the worst-case scenario. Um, I suppose the worst-case scenario is that after a year, the student becomes more mature, more interesting, and goes back to college and is more able to take, is more able to make use of it. Um, if you notice, so there's not a huge difference between the best and the worst-case scenarios. What I'm trying to tell you is that there's really no downside to taking a gap year. You will inevitably become a better version of yourself after that year. That's just what happens as you age. But obviously, not everyone here has had a chance or will be able to attend a folk high school or take a gap year. And that's okay. Um, but I want to leave you with an important shift in mindset that I think a gap year helps many students achieve. If you've taken time off from school, I'm sure that you've naturally achieved some version of this. Um, yesterday, when I arrived in Norway, I had an insightful conversation with one of the conference organizers named Marta. 
She had attended a folk high school. She loved her experience there, and she shared with me one key takeaway that she got. And that was her ability to distinguish between what she should do and what she wanted to do. Coming out of high school, we all know what we should do. We should go to a good university. We should graduate with a degree in something practical. We should get a good job. But how many of us have made the time to sit down with ourselves and think about what we want to do? Very few. Um, so let's practice. If everyone in the audience could close your eyes for a second, um, just for a minute, I want you to take a minute and think about a few things that you should do today. Perhaps there's an important paper you have to write before class tomorrow morning. Maybe there's a phone call you need to make before bed. Um, maybe you're really bad at watering the plants, and you really should water your plants tonight, or else they're all going to wilt. Right? It could be anything. But the point is, we have all of these shoulds lurking in the backs of our minds. Take a minute to think about the way those lists of shoulds make you feel. If you're anything like me, I feel a little bit more anxious than I did just a moment ago. Doesn't it feel like a burden? Now I want to switch gears. Um, keep your eyes closed if you can. Take a minute to think about something that you want to do today. Maybe after the conference, a long walk would really satisfy you. Perhaps you want to learn more about that concept you covered in class yesterday that really interested you. Maybe all you want to do is spend 20 minutes before bed today reading that book you checked out at the library last week, but you haven't gotten a chance to open because you've been so entrenched in your list of shoulds. Now take a moment to think about how that feels. How much more excited and motivated and inspired do you feel thinking about what you want to do instead of what you should be doing? And this is what a gap year affords us. A gap year affords us this year of free time where we can spend doing things that we want to do, not things that our parents or our teachers or our friends tell us we should be doing. So if you are currently in university, and if your university allows for it, consider giving yourself that free time to think about what you want and what excites you. If you are an older sibling or a friend to someone who is about to enter university, encourage them to take advantage of that time. They have nothing to lose. By taking time off from school, and by taking time on in real life, we can save ourselves from blindly pursuing the wrong successes. By taking a gap year or going to a folk high school, by thinking about what it is we want to do instead of what we should be doing, we can make sure that we're building lives that we actually want to lead. Thank you. In terms of choosing your companies, you put a lot on uh, management. What are your metrics in evaluating management? Um, we judge, we say all the time that we invest in people, uh, not just buildings. And the idea behind that is that we're looking for businesses that have big growth opportunities. Other people look for those. Uh, we're looking for businesses that are appropriately financed. Other people look for that. We focus on competitive advantage. Few people do that. That means that something, a barrier to prevent other people from doing what you're doing, a brand, like Forbes, you know, brand. Uh, and then we're trying to find someone, a leader, uh, who is smart, hardworking, someone we trust, uh, and uh, someone who people will follow. You don't become successful in a business unless you inspire people, unless people want you to be successful. Uh, and so we're trying to find that kind of a person, an honorable, honest, you know, hardworking, ethical guy or woman uh, who can make their business become much bigger. And people don't pay for that. So they pay for what is, and we're paying for what is very similar to what other people are paying, but we're expecting to get much more in the future than we are today. And businesses that are growing penalize current profitability because they invest in their businesses, and when you invest in your business, you hurt current profits. So therefore, you ordinarily are able to buy growth companies for lower prices than you would ordinary companies, because profits are a little bit less than they should be. For example? 
Um, so Ralph Lauren. Mm -hmm. uh, when Ralph Lauren was uh, going to expand, they were going to expand into Europe. They were buying back a franchisee that had done very poorly. Europe should be as big a business as America. Uh, when they bought it, they paid a high price relative to what it was currently earning. Therefore, it was dilutive. And after they made that acquisition, they now made Europe grow dramatically. They made Asia grow dramatically. They bought back franchisees as well. So that invested in their own businesses, penalized current profitability, but made them, gave themselves a big opportunity long term. And uh, you uh, talk about uh, character in management. Obviously, you can't put a number on it, but what, what are the things that, uh, it's, it's an art. What, what, are, what are the metrics? How, how, how do you evaluate? Uh, well, I'm 68, and I've been doing this for, I've been an investor since 1970, and so that's almost 40 years. And in addition to that, it's what everyone does from the time they're a kid. So you know who you want to be friends with, you know who's the smartest kid in the class. Uh, when you're going to grammar school, um, you know who you can trust. And so you're doing the same thing I've been doing this my whole life. Everyone do, does it their whole lives, except that my you know, antenna are different than most. And so you're looking for certain aspects of a person's personality that show in how he, that are evidenced in how he acts and his performance record. And it, but in 1970, I, was, I owed $15,000, and my first salary was $15,000. So I was sort of like a country today, you know, GDP is the same of <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as, uh, as my revenues. Um, and But the opportunities that you have are everywhere. They're because we've had so many problems that haven't been addressed for so long, and they're just crying for solutions. And the people who come up with the solutions and the ideas and the innovations, they're the people who are going to be the next Steve Wins and Charles Schwab's and Leo Malamud's from Chicago Mercenaries. This is an amazing country. This country, you can, you can be someone like me, and you can start with nothing. And if you have an education and you have an idea, you can create something. And people say to me, so are your children going to have, or children, young people now, going to have the same opportunities that you have? And I think the opportunity is going to be even better. So what do you look for? I mean, in addition to the business idea, do you, would you yeah. look for a certain type of personality? Yeah. Do you look for someone who's in it for the right reasons? Like, what are the things yeah. you look for? Um, I, I passion, um, hunger, uh, in, uh, ambition intelligence, obviously. Um, a person who has uh, really spent a lot of time uh, trying to perfect something, and they just need the business acumen or perhaps the things that I've learned. So I, I look for people that are really experts in a particular area and they have such a passion for it, they're obsessed with it. And then I help them do all the other things that are very difficult, like raising money and so forth. You also write in your book about your decision, the decision you made to leave college. Yeah. Um, tell me about that a little bit. You say you still have nightmares about yeah, that decision. Yeah. Um, you know, being a continuation high school student, which is an alternative school, dropping out in the ninth grade, uh, never passed a math test or was never able to have any Eng English proficiency. I finally found my way into college as a result of affirmative action. So I was able to get into a community college and then from there I got into a four year. Why affirmative action? Because you were because below a, a the poverty line? I was a foster line, kid. A foster yeah. kid, okay. So I was a, the, the government was my parental guardian, so I was able to leverage that. Five years I'll make enough of an impact that I'll be able to spend hopefully the rest of my life giving away my money with the same intentionality that I did making it. I've committed 95% of my, my wealth to charity because I really believe our society has given me all these resources. Like, I'm the luckiest man in the world. To be in America at this time, at this place, with this type of disruption occurring. Uh, and I have a son, seven years old, and you know, I think that I want to teach him how to earn money. It's fun. I was reading the book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, and I, I, had, I have a Ferrari. And my son got attached to that Ferrari, and so I sold the Ferrari because I wanted my son to understand that materialism is, you know, is not the right route. You have to learn how to earn it, right? What are challenges with your business right now? Creating culture is the most difficult thing. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I, I tend to be more of a strategic thinker, so I like to spend a lot of time alone. And obviously, as a leader, you got to be out there and you got you to talk to people and you got to meet people and spend time with them. Uh, so I'm learning that, and um, I'm trying to use algorithms to help me get there. Like, for example, I, 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 I monitor my communication frequency to various individuals and make sure that I'm adding you know, more people in depth and asking the right questions of those individuals, uh, hiring people that put you in your strength zone and augment your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do it analytically mm -hmm. uh, because I made a mistake. I hired 500 people in a year. Uh, I think it went from 80 employees to about 500. And my culture got away from me. Mm. And my structure got away from me. And uh, next thing you know, I showed up to an office that I hated. I didn't want to come to work anymore in the very company that I own. What advice would you give to someone who's in that situation now, a CEO? Uh, what, yeah. what do you do? Tony Shea told me this. He said, slow down your growth at all costs. Because growth covers mud. But as a startup entrepreneur, all you want is growth. When we got to 65 million a month in sales, I would hit refresh on my mobile app and I'd see $1,000 a minute come in. 
right? Like that's the dream. Mm -hmm. uh, that became the nightmare. When you're growing that fast, you know, you start to think you walk on water and uh, next thing you know, I'm buying a Challenger 300 jet. It's not a wise use of money. And so what you slow down the growth and do you kind of discipline yourself in terms of uh, what to do with your resources? Yeah, yeah, you, uh, um, it's real easy to hire people to spend your money. So when you're making 120 million, every executive in the world wants to come and get that job and then hire 20 people and hire 20 people and hire 20 people. Uh, I, right now I'm using a much more disciplined process in my startups, much more measured. And um, I don't spend any, uh, I, I have an anti-waste policy on the inside of the walls. So if I want to have a, you know, a private plane ride, which I do on occasion, I spend that money outside the company, not inside the company. Because the company should be spending all of its, all of its resources on uh, developing and adding value to its customers and to its employees. I mean, every penny of it, not on um, you know, the, the, the C-suite. Mm -hmm. The mental um, awareness of the players, the fact that they, their heads dropped, and you speak about the yellow card, for instance, things changed. The one scrum where they completely gave up, you spoke about it uh, off air. Mentally, they just unfortunately don't seem to be part of this. Oh, it's, it's been a sad thing. I think we, we, we didn't really have identity as if we have to sit around now and think about what is our leadership group in that side? Who is there? What is that spine that everyone goes back to where the players have to sit and be honest with themselves, as Nas is, is mentioning, that the players have to take responsibility. Who are those players who take responsibility? We talked about the time when we were missing a scrum off. New Zealand played with Ben Smith at scrum off because he took control. And he's one of the leadership groups in the New Zealand side. He says, you know what, we're going to do it like this. This is how we're going to go. So none, none, none of the players have done that. And then if you look at that, the culture in the team, it's almost everyone has gone into their own shells because now they feel isolated because they're making so much mistakes. And then what has happened is that players are not really picking each other up because now they're thinking, I don't want to make a mistake, I'd rather hide away. Yeah. And then at the end, that fight was lost for me. Yeah. And it was not just lost in the times where we drop our heads down. Yeah. It's lost when you're sitting around and not trying to put up an effort again so that you can add on and put some value into the side. And that is what has been missing the whole season. And you have to ask yourself, where was the leadership? Fixing it, yeah. fixing it. Folks, I, I just think we need someone in South African rugby that comes out and say, listen, this is our vision. I'm yeah. in control. Yeah. I'm taking control of everything. We had an Indaba. We had someone coming in, running the Indaba that's not a coach or involved at SA Rugby. The head yeah. coach or the director of rugby should step in there and say, listen, this is how things are going to work. You need to do this. You need to do this. And this totally. is how we're going to go forward. Totally. Alistair Kutir, he talked about body language mm. before the game. His body language. Sorry. He must be out. Remember, his players are going to look up to him. He exactly. must be confident. He must be bold. We're South Africa. Yeah. You can't go out there in your shells and maybe and excuses. Yeah. Someone needs to step up, say, listen, we South Africans, this is how we're going to do this. This is our DNA. Yeah. On and off the field, our culture, everything. Is it we possible, to... though? Is it possible for Alistair Kutsia to turn around and say, this is what I need in place, and that will follow? Is it possible? <clears throat> no, I think, I, I don't know whether it's possible, but there is definitely, there are people who lead and lead inspirationally, and those who, who don't. And I'll take the example of the England side, and I'll take Lancaster, who's a very decent person, yep. who put structures in place, selected good players, but he couldn't inspire his team to do extraordinary things. And this is what Eddie Jones can do. He comes in, takes the same players, makes a difficult guy captain, uh, changes a little bit of the culture, makes them a bit more edgy, gives them self-belief. Yep. They're on a 13-match winning streak.